Today on the BRS 160, we're going to get electrical. Hi guys, my name is Ryan. Welcome to another week of the BRS 160, where every week we do our best to help you guys, members of the reefing community, enjoy your tanks and find new ways to explore the hobby. We do that by following the setup and progression of this 160 gallon reef tank. This week we're going to dive into the electrical needs for the tank. We're dealing with salt water and electricity, which can be both a health and fire hazard. It's not that difficult to make it safe as long as you plan for this when you set the tank up. Most important components to consider are your home's electrical infrastructure, water safety, and proper cord management. We'll of course finish with the installation of our solution for the BRS160. First step of this is make sure you have enough power for your tank. Just to give you an idea of the typical consumption for a 4 foot reef tank, you probably have a 300 watt heater, LED lighting is around 300 watts, 50 to 100 watts of power heads, 100 watt return pump, 50 watt skimmer, and maybe another 50 or 100 for other filtration equipment. So that's a baseline of about 1000 watts for a typical aquarium. At a chiller, UV sterilizer, T5 or halide lighting, calcium reactor, ozone reactor, zeovit reactor, refugiums, and other various pieces of gear, and you can quickly start using a considerable amount of power. Most homes will have 15 amp circuits, but if you're lucky, the circuit might be 20 amps. On a 15 amp circuit, you can run around 1800 watts, and on a 20 amp circuit, it'll be around 2400 watts. Best way to identify this is locate the circuit breaker, and it'll say on the end of the switch. If you have a limited amount of power available at the location you want to place a tank and adding another circuit just isn't an option, you can reduce this electrical load significantly by selecting energy efficient equipment like LED lighting and only installing the things you absolutely need on the tank. Now that you know what you're working with and have an idea of how much power your tank is going to consume, we need to figure out what else is on that circuit. If you can, get as many things off the outlets on the circuit you plan on using as possible. Make sure that nothing that consumes a ton of power is on that circuit. For example, it's a bad idea to use the same circuit that has a 1200 watt microwave on it, a 1000 watt entertainment system, or a space heater on it, because there will be very little power left for the aquarium before the breakers trigger. Keep in mind that we don't want the breakers to trigger ever because the tank needs power to maintain the life support system. The breakers triggering are also a warning sign that you're overloading that circuit, which is a fire hazard and should not be ignored. If you're uncertain about any of this and want some advice or want to get a second circuit installed, Google Craigslist or Angie's List an electrician and get it done right. Once you've figured out your electrical load and how you're going to handle it, try to avoid plugging more occasional high consumption items into that circuit in the future. And make sure to let your family know that's a bad idea to plug in vacuums, clothes irons, hair dryers, and similar items into these outlets. Since we're dealing with water, it's also highly recommended to use either GFI outlets or circuit breakers with GFIs, which help protect your tank and home from shorts, especially those related to water. If you can't do that, you can also find power bars, which have GFIs built in. Some reefers might suggest against using GFIs because they can be accidentally triggered, but I think protecting your home kind of trumps all and there isn't a lot of debate to be had. If you can't use a GFI or don't want to, you do have other alternatives, mainly being just put more effort into other safety elements. Biggest issue to consider is water always runs downhill and power cords are like water freeways that lead straight into a high power electrical box. More or less we need to address this and completely eliminate these cord freeways, which means something like a power bar laying down in the bottom of the stand where water can flow right into them is not okay, not even for a single day. In an ideal world, that means we would install all of our power bars and outlets above the tank. Water doesn't travel up, so this is the safest option, but most of us can't do that. So we do the next best thing, which is install drip loops. You'll find a diagram of a drip loop with basically anything electrical sold for use with an aquarium. It's more or less a bend in the cord, so if something leaked and started to travel down the cord, it would fall off the bend in the loop rather than flow straight into an electrical socket. We also need to put something in place to secure the loop in place, like a hook, clamp, or zip ties. Your power bar should be mounted as high as possible and away from things that can spray if they malfunction or get ignored, like a full protein skimmer. Well, they're typically not considered watertight. I also like to plug unused outlets with caps, which will reduce the chances of random spray causing an issue. It's also wise not to put the tank directly in front of an outlet if possible and put it beside the outlet instead. This makes it a lot easier to keep the water from running into the outlet if something were ever to happen to your drip loops. The next piece of this is neatness and organization counts. If it looks neat and organized with everything securely mounted, the chances of it being safe go way up over the painfully common cord octopus, which is typically never safe. 
I think one of the best ways to achieve that is to mount everything to a separate board where you can neatly and securely route all of your cords behind the board. Then mount the board inside your stand or on the wall. One of the most common boards for this is just a white Rubbermaid shelf which can be found at any large hardware store for just a few bucks. On the back of the board, you can use a variety of different things to secure the cords. For equipment and cords, I'm fairly certain are not going to change a lot and I won't have to remove for maintenance. Zip ties and these adhesive pads work well. For items like skimmers, pumps, and heaters, which do need to be removed periodically for cleaning and replacement, I suggest using Velcro straps or something similar which are easy to open, close, and reuse. I also like these plastic adhesive clamps which allow you to easily open and close them. Make sure to drill the holes big enough that you can get all the cords and heads through. On the front of the board you can install these furniture hole covers which close the hole and make it a bit cleaner. These can also be found at most larger hardware stores. One note specifically related to routing your pH, salinity, and ORP probes. These probes can have noise interference issues if you route them with all of your power cords and near noisy ballast. Probes also need to be replaced, so if you can, try to route them away from all the other cords and make them easy to remove without cutting a bunch of zip ties apart. If that is impossible, try to use a higher quality probe, which are commonly referred to as lab grade probes. Most of these should have better shielding on the cord to eliminate or reduce that noise and give more accurate readings. If you're interested in how it achieves that or what makes a lab grade probe different, check out our video on our site. It's pretty interesting how some things that look exactly the same can perform so differently. Okay, so on to our install. This is going to be pretty simple because we don't have many things hooked up to the tank yet. But I'm going to get the infrastructure in place for success later. First, I had an electrician install a 20 amp circuit just for this tank. Over the course of this series, we're going to plug a ton of equipment into the tank, and I just don't want any issues. If we knew we were going to install halide lighting in a chiller, both which consume a lot of power, I might have had them install two circuits. The circuit is GFI'd here at the breaker box, which will protect me and the building if anything were to ever go wrong. The outlets themselves I had installed higher than the tank itself on an imposing wall away from the sump. The chances of water getting into these outlets is pretty slim. We also mounted our board, which has our power bars with holes drilled for the cords to go through. As long as we always bring the cord up through the hole and plug the cord into a socket above the hole, that will serve as a permanent drip loops that won't get disturbed. We left room on the board to mount other equipment like the Vectors controller. Ultimately, we're also going to use the same board to mount all of the aquarium controller equipment and accessories. If you really hate cords, there's also cord management tracks you can buy which hide everything. I think you can probably start to see what I mean when I say clean and organized typically also means safe. This room has a fire alarm and sprinklers in it, but if yours doesn't, install a smoke detector. If you have a cord octopus disaster and despite everything that you saw here today, don't plan on fixing it, do yourself a favor and pick up a small fire extinguisher as well. Couple last tips related to electrical safety. Make sure your power bars can handle the load and don't look for the cheapest thing out there. Your whole tank is depending on this thing to work, so buy something quality from a brand you recognize and trust. We use these cool kilowatt PS10 power bars, which are also a surge protector and electricity monitor that displays min-max volts, amps, watts, leakage current, and eliminates harmful voltage spikes with a soft power up. In relation to equipment safety and quality, there's a lot of super cheap aquarium equipment being imported these days. The cost of these things can make them super enticing, but there's a reason they're so cheap. Ultra low cost imports are almost never associated with high quality, but more importantly safety. You're going to have to weigh the value versus quality and safety on your own. Last tip I have for you is if you're a beginner and find all this intimidating, give some thought to those all-in-one tanks like the Nuvo from Innovative Marine. They do consume less power than the average tank and the nature of not having a sump with water in the cabinet below makes it a lot easier to install a safe electrical solution. Next week we're going to get water into the tank and you seriously don't want to miss it, so hit that subscribe button. If you're interested in learning more about any of the products that we talked about in today's video, hit this link. See you next week with episode 7 of the BRS 160, Water.